I'm enormously grateful to, uh, to our representatives and senators for joining us for today's presentation. As you know, this Blue Pacific Futures webinar series is a collaboration between Georgetown University Center for Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific Studies, and the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, we're very pleased to be joined today by uh, Senator Brian Schatz, Senator Maisie Hirono, uh, Representative Ed Case, and uh, Representative Kai Kahaley. Uh, in or we were under a bit of time pressure. I, I have to say, I just had late notice that the uh, Senate is scheduled a vote on the NDAA shortly, and uh, and given the the busy schedule, what I'd like to do would be to forego uh, an elaborate introduction to each one of our speakers. Uh, you saw their bios on the res reservation uh, page for today's event, and what I'd like to do would be to to pitch to each one of the. Uh, the, the speakers and ask them to maybe just take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about uh, the way they see the Pacific Islands uh, in in uh, from the frame of Hawaii, and then I'll open up with a series of questions to our to our four panelists. And a word of warning: uh, my screen is acting up a little bit. If for some reason suddenly I stop moving or stop or I don't hear you, um, I just would ask just to go to the next speaker. Thank you so much. And so, Senator Schatz, could we toss to you first, and just uh, just briefly? Talk a little bit about uh, Hawaii's interest in the Pacific Islands. Thanks. Well, uh, first of all, thank you for doing this and thanks to all of the attendees. And it really is great to get the whole Hawaii congressional delegation uh, on this Zoom for this purpose. It kind of shows our uh, collective commitment, you know, not just to uh, Hawaii as, uh, you know, the headquarters of the Pacific Command and all of that, but uh, for all of us as policymakers, we understand that our predecessor, our, uh, uh, my predecessor in particular, Daniel K. Inouye, understood his job to be someone who represented uh, island nations throughout the Pacific region that didn't have representation in Congress. And so I'm pleased to be here on that basis. Let me give you five uh, areas uh, where I think the United States needs to do uh, better. First, we need to treat island nations as nations in the context, especially of the climate crisis. Uh, not as downstream from the uh, impacts um, uh, and decisions that are made in places like Glasgow and Paris and Bonn at all of these COP meetings, but rather full partners in the geopolitical sense. That's number one. Number two is that's all great and it's really critical, but they need help on the ground. There are runways that are being inundated. There are uh, fresh water sources uh, for drinking uh, and for irrigation that are now being uh, 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 increasingly saline, uh, saline um, and uh, we need to help them fix what is happening in terms of uh, climate change. Um, we also have to work as hard as we can on vaccine diplomacy and the deployment of the vaccine uh, as broadly uh, and as deeply as we can. It's not enough to just touch every country with a few uh, vaccines. We have to make this a real effort uh, and as you see the data in particular uh, Pacific Island nations, um, it does correlate with, uh, with, with economic outcomes. And so we need to be aware that there are some nations that are doing really well and some nations that need a big push and a lot of help. Um, uh, fourth, we need to tackle IUU fishing. This is an area where we can really collaborate with, for instance, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, um, South Korea, uh, Japan, and others. Um, especially as we think about, you know, so-called competition with China, it's not just a military buildup. It's also understanding that the assets of the Pacific are collective assets. They are commons and they should be protected on that basis. And finally, we need a long-term Pacific development uh, finance strategy. We need to work with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, with the DFC, with USAID, uh, with Coast Guard, with the State Department uh, to make sure that we can deploy uh, private and public sector resources for economic development. So thank you for the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Hirono. Well, just listening to Brian, uh, he pretty much covered all of the areas uh, that I'm sorry. I, I was going to. Yeah, well, can I leave now? <laughs> I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. Well, clearly our delegation works really well together because we, uh, as an island uh, state, we are very aware of the importance of the Pacific Island nations. And I think as a delegation, we pay due respect 
to the importance of our alliances throughout the Asia Pacific area. And as a member of the Armed Services Committee, of course, I am especially focused on some of the initiatives that we have that will build uh, our alliances with the Pacific Island nations. And the fact that uh, we can do and should be doing a lot more in terms of, for example, vaccination distribution that Brian talked about. Uh, but we also have other initiatives that involve military exercises, the biggest being RIMPAC, uh, which involves over two dozen countries from the Asia Pacific area. And so all of the alliances that we have in this part of the world is part of what I consider the asymmetric advantage that we have over China, because China is our biggest competitor. And uh, China has been very busy in our part of the world with, with their Belt and Road Initiative as they seek to really expand their influence, not just in our part of the world, but in Africa and other places. And they are in there with a the whole of government approach to island nations. They're building hotels, they're uh, building up reefs and all of that. And so China is very intent on expanding their influence in our part of the world. And so it makes it even more important that initiatives such as the Pacific Defense Initiative that, we, uh, that would really focus our assets and uh, uh, resources to the, the Asia Pacific area. Um, when we have something like PDI, it is really important that we don't just say, well, that's a nice thing to recognize the importance of this part of the world, but we actually have to put resources here. And in that regard, it became pretty clear that the Department of Defense had not put enough of the kind of attention and resources that we would like. And so there was a mismatch. And I have joined with Senator Sullivan and the NDAA to have language that requires the DOD to uh, make sure that we are actually aligning resources with the importance of this part of the world. And uh, island nations are that uh, uh, where so much of their economy is dependent on fishing, it is really important that our country works with them uh, to help them with um, the, the illegal, unreported, uh, unregulated fishing. And so uh, the kind of programs that we have to train them, to interdict, uh, not just uh, illegal fishing, but uh, uh, human trafficking uh, and drug trafficking, the, the kind of partnering that we can do and training we can do through the Coast Guard, for example, is, uh, uh, is the kind of practical um, kinds of things that we can do. And, and, I, and I want to close by uh, talking about the importance of the compact that we have with, the, uh, with Micronesia, Palau, and uh, uh, Marshall Islands. And the, these compacts are very important to our national security, but I don't think that as a nation, we uh, provide enough resources and, and enough in terms of the kind of partnering we can do to help them with their infrastructure needs, et cetera, uh, to, to acknowledge how important these compacts are. And we are in the process of renegotiating these compacts, very important to our national defense. Uh, and so the, the, this is uh, the, the kind of area that I point out to the military brass starting from the Department of uh, Secretary of the DOD uh, and making sure that we, we are acknowledging and providing resources to our uh, island nation friends in the Asia Pacific area. So we all sit on different committees. You probably know that, Alan. And, and part of the reason for that is that uh, we all were very much in, in the committees that we are on, uh, pay attention to what's going on in our part of the world and of course uh, to represent Hawaii strongly. And I wanna mention, of course, thank you Georgetown University and the University of Hawaii and all the students from um, th th that are on this program. But I happen to be, I think I'm the only graduate of both these schools. So there, <laughs> yes. So mahalo nui loa for all of the research and, and the uh, good works that both of these programs do. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Senator. Mr. Case, I feel like I've got to know you very, very well through this little tiny box of Zoom, but uh, it's great to see you again. And uh, I know that you've been a, a leader in, in putting together the, the uh, Pacific Island Caucus in the House, and I'd love to hear your, your introductory comments. Uh, thank you so much, Alan, and thank you for all of your uh, involvement in the Pacific Islands for so long. I mean, all of us have relied on you in one way or another, and I'm I'm really happy to be part of this. And and I and, and I think um, 
as Brian, I think, said, uh, the fact that all four of us are on this call all attests to our interest in, in the Pacific Islands. Um, I do, uh, I do, you know, of course, uh, this is all extremely topical on many, many different levels uh, from, mm -hmm. from, you know, China to climate changes, as Senator Schatz uh, mentioned, and, and Maisie speaking to many of our um, efforts in, in the defense uh, part of it. We've seen firsthand our, our uh, Pacific Island leaders stepping forward again on the world stage in the last couple of months at the United Nations and at COP26, especially on the issue of climate change, where they have been the world leaders for, for decades now. Uh, this is an existential threat for them. And, and it's, it's uh, uh, gratifying in one way to finally have them be a little bit more listened to along these lines. Uh, um, but of course, we have to take action at this point. I guess I would also note at the outset that, um, you know, in, in the Pacific, we are all one ohana, our family, uh, for those that are not familiar with that word, and I think it's comparable in New Zealand. Um, um, and anytime there is, um, you know, uh, dislocation and unrest anywhere in the Pacific, it's, it's a concern to all of us. So, uh, I certainly uh, wish the Solomon Islands the, the very best in working out uh, what is happening there right now. That is, uh, that is a, that's a concern for everybody, and we wish them very well. Um, I, I appreciate your mentioning our Pacific Islands Caucus because uh, really uh, one of my observations uh, coming back to Congress was that um, at a time when the importance of the Pacific generally and the Pacific Islands in particular. So when I'm talking here about the Pacific Islands, I'm not uh, talking so much about the rim countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, um, you know, et cetera, but uh, I'm talking about the actual Pacific Island jurisdictions, the 25 or so jurisdictions. Uh, independent countries, uh, territories, uh, uh, departments of, of some countries freely associated, but all re really with a common uh, culture um, and, and a common way of, of going about life and common challenges from climate change to, to geographic isolationism to, to um, you know, difficulties in, a, in, a, in developing a broad range of, of economic uh, activities and thus exposure, particular exposure to pandemics uh, such as uh, uh, COVID that of course we know have, have been tremendously damaging to many of our Pacific Island uh, uh, countries and, and jurisdictions. Um, and that was one of the reasons why we did form the Pacific Islands Caucus a few years back uh, in Congress where uh, I and other members uh, who felt strongly that we needed a better centralized focus out of, out of the, the US House of Representatives uh, on the Pacific Islands, uh, got together on a bipartisan basis and formed our Pacific Islands uh, Caucus uh, which now has a couple dozen members to it, uh, including the leaders of many of the committees of uh, jurisdiction and subcommittees of jurisdiction. Uh, tremendously well received uh, by the Pacific Islands themselves. Uh, we've worked with you and other scholars. Uh, we've worked with pretty much all of the embassies um, on, on actually turning our, our, our focus into legislation, of which the primary vehicle is the Blue Pacific Act, which uh, uh, basically stands for boosting long-term U.S. engagement in the Pacific. It's designed uh, really to direct, um, uh, to, to magnify and accelerate and diversify um, our own foreign aid uh, and assistance uh, to the countries and islands of, of the Pacific. It's not uh, focused uh, on, the, on the defense side. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on there. Uh, Maisie spoke to the Pacific Deterrence Initiative that's invaluable from that perspective, but the Blue Pacific Act aims at uh, humanitarian, at, uh, at security assistance to illegal fishing, which both of the senators uh, spoke to uh, really on a coordinated basis. This has been lacking in our, in our, in our public policy uh, for, for a while now. Uh, and um, that Blue Pacific Act is moving along just fine in, in, the, in the House. It's now part of the broader Eagle Act. It also has uh, elements from uh, bills that uh, the two US senators here uh, have worked on and have sent uh, over to us from from the Senate, and we're we're really hoping that once the Senate figures out the NDAA, we'll turn back to <laughs> the we have to figure it out. <laughs> Private inside joke, but um, that we will also turn back um, to to um, the the engagements of the Pacific that we are aiming at at uh, whether they be the, be the Blue Pacific Act or or others. I guess I would mention just really briefly um, in in my time uh, remaining. Um, back to your, I think your original question was where does Hawaii fit into all of this? Um, obviously, in Hawaii, uh, we fit into this in, in innumerable ways. Um, and of course, you know, Indo-PACOM being located in Hawaii and, and the strategic location of Hawaii has a lot to do with it. But anybody that thinks that that's kind of the end of it um, is making a, a huge mistake. And I think uh, most of us understand that in the Pacific. Uh, we, we, of course, um, come from a common culture and, 
whether we're ethnically Pacific or not, we are still of that culture. We still think that way. We are still able to, uh, I guess what I would say, uh, provide cultural translation between the, the Pacific islands and, and our country and perhaps other countries in the ways that we navigate uh, Washington, DC. We certainly have some of the leading institutions uh, in the world on the Pacific uh, in Hawaii, uh, whether it be the East West Center or the Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies um, or the University of Hawaii itself or other um, institutions uh, where world-class uh, work is being done on the Pacific Islands and, and where many, many, many of the leaders of the Pacific Islands have been educated and still are educated. And so, um, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's more than just a, a saying that uh, in, in Hawaii, we, we really are in many ways, um, our country's uh, at least a center uh, of the Pacific. And that's a role that we welcome and relish, but we, we need to turn that into action. Back to you. Great, thank you. Mr. Kahaley, we wonder if we could get your, your views on uh, Hawaii's place uh, in, in the Pacific Islands. Hey, Alan, thanks so much. And, and uh, it's great to be here with all of you and mahalo nui loa for uh, inviting me to this, uh, you know, Georgetown, University of Hawaii, Blue Pacific Futures uh, discussion. You know, I get to go last, uh, junior member of the delegation. Um, and, uh, you know, many of my, my, my colleagues have already touched on a lot of really important things for the Pacific. But I'm, I'm excited to be here in the Congress to represent Hawaii. I'm proud that Hawaii has sent a native Hawaiian back to the United States Congress, you know, following the, the big uh, hard to fill sometimes shoes of Senator Akaka. Uh, but I am proud that the state of Hawaii and the East West Center host this Pacific Islands Conference. Uh, uh, and that this year, a number of critical regional priorities are being discussed. Um, things are, are really important to the delegation, climate change and the impacts on our Pacific Island nations, COVID-19 and helping those nations get through the pandemic recovery. Um, connecting the digital connectivity between the Pacific and infrastructure development, uh, marine resources development and conservation, especially as it has to do with uh, Papahanao, Mokuakea, Northwest Hawaiian Islands, um, some of our fisheries in the Western Pacific, and uh, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific continent that I know our Pacific leaders are developing. Pacific leaders, uh, Alan, have contributed uh, greatly to U.S. Uh, national security and prosperity, and um, our exclusive access to military testing ranges in our COFA countries are critical for the national defense of our country. Um, Pacific Islanders, uh, like myself, who serve in the Hawaii National Guard, serve in the U.S. military at a disproportionately higher rate. But historically, this population uh, has often been overlooked and, and treated unfairly in, in, in many cases. Um, as we wind down 20 years of uh, war in the Middle East and counterterrorism operations, uh, uh, and we pivot to the Pacific um, and given the current security environment and increase attention to China, um, you know, this region is finally getting uh, the attention it deserves. You know, Senator Hirono uh, and myself both serve on our respective armed services committee. Uh, and, and that allows me to be a strong supporter of the Pacific Deterrence Initiative, uh, which uh, is planned to invest almost $5 billion into vital military capabilities in the Pacific to deter China in the Pacific region in the FY22 Defense Appropriations Bill. Everything from the TACMAR over the horizon radar in Palau to the um, Homeland Defense radars in Hawaii and Guam. Um, there's a lot of uh, really important things uh, that, that need to be done in the Pacific for us to um, be able to position ourselves um, to stay ahead of that pacing threat, which is, which is China. Um, on the uh, other side, uh, I'm a proud member of the Pacific Islands Caucus, which Congressman Case talked about uh, in the U.S. House. I'm a co-sponsor of uh, the Blue Pacific Act, uh, boosting long-term U.S. engagement in the Pacific. And this bill, like he mentioned, will significantly expand U.S. engagement in the Pacific Islands region and uh, provide um, almost a billion dollars in U.S. assistance for the Pacific Islands region over the next um, five fiscal years. Just a few weeks ago, we had a chance to meet with the president of Palau and his delegation. Um, uh, you know, we are um, and have conveyed to the administration how important it is that we uh, come to the table and negotiate in good faith and come to an agreement before this, these agreements expire um, with, with our FAS and our, and our COFA states. And that's, it's really, really important uh, for us to do that. Um, and, uh, and we had a chance to meet with uh, 
the uh, President Palau and, and, and his delegation and everything from um, uh, security issues in the region, illegal fishing, human and narcotics trafficking, unlicensed mineral exploitation and pollution. These are all things that are really, really important that um, you know, we, we need to talk about. And, and I'm hoping this administration does that. You know, we've encouraged this administration to uh, appoint as quickly as possible an assistant secretary for insular affairs in the Department of Interior that is still unfilled. Uh, so that person can be the belly button for DOI in the Pacific. We've also advocated for a special uh, envoy uh, designee to lead these negotiations um, uh, that are really, really important to Palau and, and, and our smaller Pacific Island nations. But again, ma mahalo, Alan, for, for having myself and the rest of the delegation here. Um, and uh, thanks so much. And I really appreciate it. Aloha. Thank you very much. Uh, your comments are very much appreciated. I, I wonder if I could, um, uh, several of you have mentioned the, the COFA states and uh, negotiations on uh, the, the next negotiations for, for, the, for the compact states. And I know that the relationship between uh, Hawaii as, as a destination for many citizens of FF, FSM, Marshall Islands, and Palau, that there's a, there's a strong relationship there. I was wondering if I could get you to talk a little bit about um, uh, Hawaii and the, the, as a, as a uh, destination for uh, COFA citizens, and maybe talk a little bit more deeply about, about some of the challenges that COFA states face. Um, it seems to me that, that you know, the vaccine diplomacy has, has worked very nicely. Uh, but there are still some some serious challenges, and you know we have the problem of of, the, of Pacific regionalism, and Pacific regionalism seems to have been dented uh, by the last uh, round of elections for the um, uh, the Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum. So I was just wondering if I could uh, just sort of tease out from from you a little bit uh, a few other comments about uh, the U.S. relationship with the COFA states, what the U.S. could do to re encourage the, 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 the renewal of Pacific regionalism and address some of those challenges that, uh, that are, exist in the funding of the, the, uh, the compacts. And that's for whoever wants it. I think that the, uh, the two of us who are members of the, our respective armed services committee are very uh, aware of the importance of the compacts, but the th challenge is that I, I don't think that too many others of our colleagues understand the importance of uh, these island nations to us and that these compacts are so important that they, their citizens can come to any state without the need for a visa. And this is why, especially during the pandemic, it became very clear that, you know, that Hawaii and Guam host more compact citizens than any other places. There are some in Guam and there are some, uh, I'm sorry, Arkansas, I believe, and some other areas, but uh, this is not a population that is necessarily acknowledged, but during the pandemic, it was clear a lot of them were in the front lines, working in meatpacking uh, plants and, and all of that. And that is why I am very uh, aware of the need for advocacy on our part to, um, to let everyone know that uh, as we negotiate the, these compacts that we provide more resources to these uh, island nations because of course they have uh, education issues, they have economic issues, they have healthcare issues. And one of them, as far as I'm concerned, one of the major things that we did to help the compact citizens was to enable them to qualify for Medicaid. Uh, this is a qualification that was taken away from them uh, during the, the, the Clinton, as part of the Clinton so-called welfare reform. And it took us uh, literally 10 years to restore that eligibility to them. And, and, and so we also have a bill to uh, enable them to access some of the other social network programs, social uh, underpinning programs that they should have. But it's a, it's a pretty, uh, challenging road to hold, wouldn't you say, my colleagues? <laughs> yeah, let me just add a couple of things. You know, obviously, the the, the sort of top line is we have to um, renegotiate the compact of free association. That's obvious. Um, let me make a couple of observations. Um, you know, it's not just bases. And I think the challenge is that the Department of Defense understandably thinks in terms of, uh, you know, being forward and having access and being operational in the region, that's a reasonable aspect of our relationship. But we do need to think of, of our relationship as a relationship with sovereigns, right? Um, not wards of the state, um, not folks who 
um, uh, need assistance, but other countries, other nations, other cultures, other sovereigns. And I think the reason that I think it's so important that we talk in those terms is that I've never seen so much racism in Hawaii as I have um, uh, with our FSM brothers and sisters. And that is something that I think all of us collectively have a responsibility to fight against. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's just historically true that whoever is the most recent immigrant group usually gets picked on, um, but that doesn't make it any more right. And that's something that I think we have a collective obligation uh, to fight against, especially given Hawaii's, uh, you know, not a perfect history, but a better history of, of integrating various cultures uh, into our melting pot. Mm -hmm. I think I think I would um, I, I, I want to amplify everything that my colleagues just said. I mean, um, the uh, focusing just on the Kofa countries just for 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 now. Um, of course, the, the challenges that the Pacific Islands face are 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 economic, uh, healthcare, education, um, and it is completely natural for for folks to to want to seek um, a better life and uh, a better place. And of course, those countries' challenges is to try and our challenges to try to help them to provide that life uh, in the countries of, of origin uh, for those that want to stay there. Um, um, the, the, co the compacts have been um, incredible agreements uh, for our country and for their countries all around. Um, places like Hawaii have been asked to bear a disproportionate burden for that. And we're talking about in the hundreds of millions of dollars a year of uncompensated uh, federally required services. And that's why Maisie's efforts on Medicaid were incredibly valuable and it's unfinished business. Um, and what Brian says is exactly right. Um, there, there's a tremendous uh, cultural dislocation that comes uh, from, from, from you know, leaving your island homes in the Pacific and moving to Honolulu or Wellington or, or Auckland or anywhere else uh, or, or for that matter. And we know that we now have larger populations of Pacific Islanders from some countries in our countries than are in the countries of origin to start with. Um, um, the other side of it is it's really exciting uh, to see the, the, the development of, of these communities um, in Hawaii and elsewhere in, into real generations of, of involvement and influence and advancement uh, uh, across the board. Uh, I know that each of us has had that experience. I've, I've, I've had interns uh, from, from the Pacific Islands in my office. I've nominated them to our service academies. They're going to be leaders of our military at the upper ranks, I'm, I'm positive of that. And so we've got to keep that going. So I think, you know, from our perspective, we are all focused on, 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 on moving those compacts along as fast as possible. What Congressman Kaeli spoke to is exactly right. We don't frankly think this administration is giving them sufficient focus yet and sufficient, um, um, advancement on, on a quick enough basis. And that's what they want. And that's what we think they should want. And we want it too. So that's part of all of our effort. I want to talk just briefly to your comment on Pacific regionalism, because I think this is really a real challenge for the Pacific right now. Uh, the Pacific Islands Forum um, has served very, very well from that perspective uh, to, to bring the Pacific Island jurisdictions and countries together to try to think of, 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 of the Pacific in in a collective sense, um, as opposed to individual and to work together collectively on climate change or economic development or any other number of things. And, you know, obviously um, uh, some of our um, competitors, uh, particularly China, uh, would love uh, that regionalism to fail. Uh, if they can't dominate it, they'd, they'd rather divide and conquer. Um, and, I th and I think that we have to be very practical and very realistic about that. So the so that the current challenge to the forum is of great concern to me. And I, I, I very much hope that they work it out. Now it's their forum, it's not our forum. And you know, uh, we're, we're, we don't wanna dictate um, uh, what they should or shouldn't do, but I certainly hope and believe and, and uh, encourage uh, that that be worked out because the failure of the forum, I think would be a, a big setback for, for the Pacific. Yeah, I, I, Alan, I'll just chime in. You know, I mean, I look at it real simply, right? The Kofa states are ours to lose, the United States to lose. And, um, you know, that would be devastating to, to, um, to our country on, on a number of fronts. You know, the Pacific Island region is, is very dynamic. It's, it changes every day. China is on that doorstep every day. And uh, in many times, it's changing not necessarily in the United States' favor. You look at Micronesia, who's withdrawn from the Pacific Islands Forum, and um, you know statements made by this administration, uh, where the Secretary of State in, in testifying that these negotiations are a priority 
those are his own words, but there have been no meaningful negotiations or conversations that have happened, at least publicly, um, that I know about since then. You know, when we look at the, like what Senator Schatz talked about, you know, I live on Hawaii Island, out in Ocean View, going towards my, you know, ancestral home of Mililii, is a large um, community um, uh, there in Ocean View of Micronesians and, um, and, and different Pacific Island um, um, communities there. And, and there's a generational trauma that, that these communities have, have had to endure um, because of nuclear testing and things that we've done a long time ago. So when you look at Runet Dome and the United States responsibility to make sure that radioactive material is housed safely, uh, that's something that we got to address. And so um, it's about relationships. Um, it's about uh, that marriage and nurturing that and, and having, um, you know, uh, you know, the right opportunity and, and negotiating um, opportunities with these countries. And what we don't want to do is have these um, agreements expire or, or take um, how they, it took over seven years for these agreements in the case of Palau. Um, uh, and then, then, then you get into a fight of who's paying for it. And you get Congress got to come in and pay for it. And then it's discretionary dollars versus mandatory dollars. And what kind of message are we sending when it's funded via discretionary dollars? So that's just my thoughts. That it's ours to lose. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just curious. Then we had a we had a question from Greg Brown at uh, Georgetown University, and you know, and and many have have mused over over the past few years about the United States or others uh, extending compacts of free association with uh, Kiribati, for instance. And I'm, I'm assuming that given the comments that I've heard here today, uh, that wouldn't be very high on your priority. Would, would that be safe to say? Or is there room to, to countenance expanding the, the compacts of free association to other Pacific Island countries? Um, well, I guess I, I've never thought about it. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's a worthy thought. I mean, uh, we want to strengthen our engagement and relationships in, in the Pacific. Uh, the compacts are, are one of our relationships and engagements that happens to have a, 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 a historic uh, basis to it in the old trust territory of the Pacific Islands, which did not, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, academic scholars did not include Kiribati. Um, and so, and so, but, I guess I, I don't react against it on a no basis. I guess maybe what I react again, uh, I react to it on is um, um, on the basis of we need to get these compacts done and right again for, for 10 years. Now, Kiribati is, of course, as we all know, a major issue right now uh, because, um, first of all, it's the closest to us in Hawaii and, and uh, on, on a number of ways. And, and yet it, it, um, it certainly um, has has um, had more engagement with China and China vice versa um, than, than many of the other Pacific Islands. So it's something we ought to be concerned about and we ought to be focused on, 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 on engagement with Kiribati uh, in particular. Could I just uh, come in on the back of that? It, this, this kind of raises for me and several of you have mentioned uh, China quite pointedly and I'm just curious, are there downsides uh, for um, really having a China-centric approach to the Pacific Islands and American foreign policy. I mean, today, you know, if, if I were to, to ask someone from overseas, can you describe US foreign policy towards the Pacific Islands? I think what I would get would be, there's, there's concern about China and the driving force is China. But is there a downside to that? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, and it's sort of maddening. Look, I understand that, um, that we need access to bases and installations and we want partners in, in the military and, and geopolitical sense. But uh, a Pacific strategy has to do with the Pacific and not solely uh, with, with our only near peer adversary. That's a, a factor, but it can't be the only one because I think what happens then is that the DOD drives all of the strategy and it becomes a matter of war preparation rather than using all of the tools in our toolkit in terms of diplomacy and soft power and economic and cultural uh, influence. And our greatest strength, in addition to the world's greatest military, uh, is that people like us and they do not enjoy getting bullied. And so just the fact that Tony Blinken is doing, um, you know, by Zoom, uh, these, these bilats, um, just the fact that 
um, these nations are being treated like nations again is central to our strategy because the way America leads is by being the indispensable nation. Um, and that is not just a matter of, well, if it ever got kinetic, we would win. Because the truth is, if it ever got kinetic, sure, we would win, but everybody would lose. And so the point here is to create peace and prosperity in the region. And the way to do that is economic partnerships, disaster prep, climate adaptation, investment, vaccine diplomacy, uh, managing our natural resources together. Um, that's the way um, that we dominate this Pacific century, but we do so in a way where it's not just purely martial and, and who's got more carriers and carrier groups and, 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 and better you know, radars and bombs. Um, we will always win that battle, but that's a heck of a way to prepare for the Pacific century. And I think it's really important that this not get driven exclusively by the DOD and by defense contractors who benefit from more and more equipment. I'd, uh, I'd like to. Uh, like, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Senator. Just very briefly. Uh, the, uh, China has a, a whole of government approach, and they, it's not just their military assets, which we're not going to, in terms of sheer numbers, they have more planes, more ships, more uh, assets, military assets. So clearly, we're not going to compete that way. Uh, China has a whole of government approach, which includes economic and, and the soft power, all of that. And that's the kind of long term approach that we need to take. China is definitely a near peer competitor, not just in the military arena, but in the, the economic area. And we shouldn't, I agree with you, Brian, that we shouldn't uh, uh, look at China as the enemy as such, but it just goes to show that we have to really refocus re on the alliances that we have throughout this part of uh, the region. And that includes Japan, that, uh, that's New Zealand, that's Australia, that's South Korea, India, and our alliances are uh, where our power, I think, lies. And that's why I refer to our alliances as our asymmetric advantage in this part of the, the world, as well as uh, basically in, in throughout the world. And I, I must say that during the Trump years, uh, our, ally, our allies really wondered where the heck we were. And now, you know, we have, uh, they're still wondering uh, what, what, what is going to be our fate, but, uh, um, I very much support a whole of government approach to uh, our dealings with China. It's, uh, thanks, uh, Alan. You know, um, you know, I agree with both Senator Schatz and, and Hirono's uh, um, comments. Uh, beyond the economic piece, another way to look at this as well is how the United States can step up in terms of economic partnerships and investments. And one of the most important things is education. You know, we know that education is, uh, um, you know, very, very important when, you know, developing an economy and developing communities and, and, and strong families. Uh, and um, the United States through the universities that we have can partner with many of these Pacific Island nations uh, to further their educational advancement. You know, and for example, Penn State University uses uh, technology to ex extract water uh, from the air. And, um, you know, when we're talking climate adaptation and salt tolerant crops and wind solar wave power production, you know, traditionally Pacific Islands have always had ways to um, uh, uh, be climate resilient and, and, and have climate adaptation and mitigation um, things that they do. So I think there's a important role for the educational component throughout the Pacific Island nations where universities can play an important role in the innovation uh, that, that can help this, you know, particular region of the world. Yeah, I mean, you know, the fact is that you can't talk about the Pacific Islands without talking about China and you can't only talk about China, and you can't only talk about everything but China. It really has to be all of the above. And and um, so without a without a as as Maisie was saying, a coordinated policy that reaches across all aspects of our government, we're we're not going to get this right. And I think we are getting it right, by the way. Uh, so I'm not I'm not I'm not fearful of it. But you know, put yourself in the situation in the Pacific Islands. I mean, you don't want us to be interested in you just because of some geopolitical um, you know, uh, competition between the US and China, but you're also caught in a, in a very realistic uh, challenge of 
of, 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 of basic, how do you provide for your nation? How do you provide for your infrastructure? How do you provide for education and healthcare and a whole range? And, and so, you know, the lesson there is China is perfectly willing and able and capable of providing all of the above. Uh, it's just that they're not providing it out of a, of, of a selfless motivation. Uh, they, they have their goals. And, and, and so if, if we're not stepping up to that plate um, on, 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 on across the board, um, we leave these nations with very few choices. Um, and, and they don't want to be in that situation, and we don't want them to be in that situation. So we have to talk realistically about China. But if that's all we're talking about, that's, that's a huge mistake, as Senator Schott said. Thank you very much. Um, as, as everyone uh, would acknowledge, the, uh, the Pacific Islands have been in the, very much in the news in the past few days uh, with the, uh, the uprise of uh, some, some violence in Honiara in the Solomon Islands. And there have been you know, accusations floating around that the United States and Taiwan have somehow uh, acted to, to, in fact, incentivize uh, through, through uh, financial contributions to Malaysia, the, the region, the province in, um, in the Solomon Islands uh, that's created some, some discord uh, there amongst the, the local population. And so rather than get stuck into the Solomon Islands, how can we ensure that with the Blue Pacific Act or with uh, Senator Schatz's uh, honor, the Honoring Oceania Act, how can we ensure that we are planning our spending and conducting our spending in a way that is mindful of, quite frankly, some of the fragility that one finds in the Pacific Islands, small conflict sensitive, climate sensitive uh, regions that, that you know, are facing numerous uh, economic challenges. So I was wondering if, if anyone would like to talk a little bit about how we ensure that we spend our money wisely and uh, not just in an accounting sense back to the United States in terms of accountability, but how do we spend it wisely uh, in the Pacific Islands? I'll, I'll take a swing at that. Um, and I, and, I, and I, I apologize if I'm gonna stay at the kind of 30,000 foot level, but I will just observe that, um, at least on the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, people, members have incredible, granular understanding of Eastern and Western Europe and all of Africa and uh, Central Asia and the Middle East. And when it comes to the Pacific, if you talk about going, you know, doing a CODEL, a, a congressional trip to the Middle East, people can't even picture in their mind's eye how far away certain places are from other places, right? Like, you know, I, I led a CODEL to, uh, to, to the Philippines, uh, Japan, and Korea, and someone said, well, can we add in India? I said, well, you know, not without a few extra days, right? And, and it's just an observation that otherwise really knowledgeable people who understand uh, leaders, leaders in exile, the status of the legislative body, uh, the status of press freedom, um, um, economic indicators, um, think of the Pacific as the thing in between CONUS and China. And so I think it starts with at uh, the oversight level for us to demand that level of expertise and sensitivity. And then I think that flows into the State Department's work and all the agencies that the State Department either works with or funds. Yes, I'd agree that the awareness of uh, the, this part of the, our part of the world is uh, very, very much uh, not exactly there. And this is why I would say that our work uh, is re really important to continue to call attention to this part of the world, but it's also not not just the island nations, but it's all the surrounding countries that, that we need to um, engage with. And during the Trump years, the State Department was hollowed out. And, and so we didn't have uh, the kind of presence in all of the, the, the island nations, not to mention our major allies, such as Japan and the other nations. So. I, really, part of it is that we have to continue to call attention, and that's where your programs matter, and that's where the East West Center matter. I would say that these programs need to attain a higher profile. And we can probably you know, look to you folks for more help because I, I would venture to say that there aren't that many people who know, know that Georgetown and University of Hawaii even has these kinds of, of programs that very much focus on uh, what's going on in the Asia Pacific area. So, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, attention building that we need to 
engage in and clearly as caucus uh, is uh, another critical area. And if you can get some of this legislation passed, sure. But in order to, in my view, you know, to get this legislation passed, other people have got to figure out, oh, this is important. We should pay attention. We should enact uh, these pieces of legislation. This is why, in my view, something as critical as simply allowing compact citizens to get uh, uh, to get Medicaid coverage took so god darn long. <laughs> Shouldn't have been like that. But we shall plug away. I, I know. I know we are. And I think with the, our continuing banking on the State Department and the DoD, uh, with maybe um, a higher profile for for uh, programs like yours. It will help. Yeah, you know, Senator, I, I, thank you. Oh, sorry. Please go ahead. ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, just, Case, I'm go just saying, ahead. I, I, I think, you know, sometimes we can overcomplicate this. I mean, um, first of all, uh, to, you know, as, as you as you asked, uh, how can we get give, uh, you know, get to the Pacific Island nations the, the aid that they need? Well, first of all, we ask them, number one. And, and then, you know, sometimes in our history, uh, we have uh, decided what others need, whether they needed it or not, uh, rather than ask them and then and then help them with that. And I think um, you know I think we're doing we're on the right track in terms of Pacific Islands, but we can always listen and uh, better. Uh, number one and number two, it's it's not rocket science what is needed. It's it's basic infrastructure, it's economic uh, development and sus uh, sustainment. It is it is the basic social infrastructure of, of education and healthcare. Um, uh, you know areas and needs that. Uh, Perhaps we tend to take for granted here a little bit sometimes, uh, and and so uh, you know these and these, as you know, are are uh, with one or two exceptions, uh, small countries with very small populations, and so it doesn't, um, you know, it, it it you can make a huge impact in a very quick uh, period, and 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 you know the the legislation that we have that we're all working on on the Pacific Islands right now is is essentially in so many words uh, trying to. Do the same thing on the non-defense side um, of our aid as uh, the Pacific Deterrence Initiative uh, is trying to do on the defense side, where we're trying to we're trying to say to our defense, uh, you know, effort, um, hey, you have to focus on the Pacific, and you have to have a, you know sources of funding that can be relied upon over time um, that are going to go to the Pacific, not you know get siphoned off somewhere else in the in the in the establishment, and so you know, it is it is. Um, I don't think the needs are complicated, uh, but the but the, the but the focus takes a while, and the and the dedication over time takes sustained effort. I see. Thank you very much. I'm just reminded of the comment uh, of uh, Robert Underwood. I didn't know if you remember Bob, but you know he was the president of uh, the University of Guam and the former delegate uh, from Guam in Congress, and he came to Georgetown and. Uh, gave the Peter Tolley Coleman speech and it was a wonderful speech. And I said to him at the end, I said, tell me a little bit about the reception of, of your colleagues about the Pacific Islands. Was there interest in Congress? And it was the only time I saw Bob frown. And he said he was really disappointed in, that, that other members simply didn't, weren't curious. And uh, I, I, I found that tremendously saddening. And uh, I hope that, that all of you uh, can help encourage uh, that kind of curiosity and, and wanting to know uh, amongst your colleagues. Um, uh, the, uh, Professor Kabutalaka from the uh, University of Hawaii, uh, my colleague in putting together th these events, uh, has just made the observation that uh, uh, the U.S. through USSP scholarship offers three scholarships per year to students in the South Pacific. China offers hundreds of scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any opportunity to increase scholarships? And I think this goes to the broader question about people to people connections between the peoples of the Pacific and, uh, and, and the mainland U.S. and also deepening the understanding, uh, the, the intellectual understandings between peoples of the Pacific and uh, uh, people here in the uh, the 50 states. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if anyone would like to comment on that. Well, I, I, I'd say that these kinds of educational exchanges are really critical. And there was a time you probably know, and I don't know the exact name of the initiative, but it was to enable hundreds of students from China 
to come to our country to study. And there was an actual focus program. I went to a reception to that. And all that's out the window now, because anytime you mention China, you have people like Tom Cotton and others just jumping up and down, uh, trying to um, make sure that we have no engagement at any level with China, which is a mistake. So uh, I, I'm sure that your programs you know, have identified different things that we can do to to shore up these kinds of engagements, but at the, at the moment, I am not particularly aware. We have sister state relationships. I think there's some exchanges that can occur, but uh, I, I am uh, open to ideas that you all have. And by the way, I just was looking at the, the screenshot that, uh, look at our delegation. We have the most diverse delegation in the entire Congress, wouldn't you say? Because I mean, I, I am an immigrant, I'm a Japanese, you have a Jewish person, Senator, you have the Caucasian person there, and then you have a Native Hawaiian, my gosh. Isn't that I, incredible? I've never been referred to that way, um, is he uh, the, the Caucasian <laughs> person? the Caucasian person? When you are the white guy. <laughs> I say that with uh, affection. You know, so taken, taken in that spirit. Of course. <laughs> let, let me just add one thing. You know, the East West Center is a, is a gem. And a couple of good uh, pieces of news about the East West Center. Susie Varis Lum uh, was just appointed as the new president. Yep. She's going to be extraordinary. Yep. Um, yeah. For the first time, uh, uh, the East West Center was, it, well, for the first time in a long time, was not uh, uh, zeroed out in the president's budget. Uh, and um, so it doesn't have to be fought fought for in yeah. the appropriations process. We can try to plus them up, but we don't have to fight back from zero. And uh, finally, they really are uh, focusing on climate um, action, climate adaptation, with a particular focus on the Pacific Islands. So while other programs have shrunk, I think the East West Center, you know, continues to do extraordinary work. And everybody knows heads of state throughout the Asia Pacific region are uh, are alumni. Of various programs and, and um, opportunities at the East West Center. Well, and, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned the new, the new president of the East West Center. She, she's fantastic. So, yes. yeah. And in my conversation with her, I said, yes, we all agree that the East West Center is a gem, but not very many people know uh, what, what, what really they do and the kind of influence that they can have throughout this part of the world. And I just want to mention that all of us have various bills that will uh, that will really focus on the spread of the world. But I actually have a bill that uh, that Senator Menendez uh, is leading, and it's called the Insular Area Climate Change Act to provide U.S. territories and the freely associated states financial and technical support for climate change planning, mitigation, adaptation, and resilience efforts. So. Here's a guy from New Jersey who's taking an interest, which is uh, progress. That's 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 tremendous. That's tremendous. That's great outreach. Um, perhaps uh, uh, we're coming up just to the last couple of minutes because I know that there is a vote scheduled in the Senate at six o'clock, and I really appreciate um, you hanging around as as you have that vote looming. But um, I just this is an opportunity, perhaps just for some some concluding uh, remarks. Um, I'd love to hear from from the the, the panel. Uh, about whether you see there's an opportunity for the United States to deepen and expand its diplomatic uh, uh, connection to the Pacific Islands. You know, we rely so heavily on countries like Australia and New Zealand uh, for engagement in Melanesia and in parts of Polynesia. Is that something we should continue to do or should we, should we develop our own relationships? Love to hear your comments. In short, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, I'm actually going to answer this slightly differently. I don't know the answer to that. And okay. I think it's pretty pretty consequential thing. And I'm not sure whether we should have our own. It sounds good to have our own direct lines of communication, but <clears throat> relationships are tricky. And and trying to establish your own, own new line of communication may subvert the existing relationship kind of ecosystem. And so I just don't know. Yeah. I um I I, th I think the answer is yes myself. Um, I think that if if you um, go out in the Pacific Islands and, and talk to talk to them, them, they will say to you that that the way we've approached the Pacific Islands, where where uh, the United States has prime uh, has has more has has focused more on Micronesia for for all kinds of reasons, obviously, than than perhaps some of the other Pacific Rim countries in Australia on 
uh, you know, Melanesia and New Zealand on, on Polynesia, even though Hawaii and New Zealand are both Polynesia, um, has had both benefits and downsides. The benefits obviously have been, um, you know, focus and coordination and, and um, 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 you know, maximization perhaps of, of assistance. The downside is that some, some of the, uh, the parts of the Pacific would, would, would like to continue that relationship, but would also like the other countries to participate as well. In other words, that, um, you know, uh, the United States, for example, should show up more in Papua New Guinea or the Solomon Islands uh, for that matter. Um, and, you know, we had a very interesting thing that just happened in, in Palau, which of course is, is, is part of Micronesia where, where um, Australian uh, military were embedded in a, in, a, in a Marine Corps exercise by our country um, in Palau. And that made huge news in Palau that 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 Australians uh, were there as well as as well as United. And I, so I think there's I think there's room for improvement. I, I think and, and speaking directly to the United States, um, the diplomatic side did suffer over the last uh, years where, where we were, you know, pulling out the Peace Corps and closing you know, consulates and and uh, doing other stuff. And what message does that send if you if you if you if you you know the Peace Corps one of the most invaluable things we've done for generations from a mm. from a U.S. Um, outreach to the rest of the world uh, gets pulled out of a country in the Pacific Islands. Uh, what what are they to make of that? Um, and you know consulates, uh, just basic consular presence and function. Uh, that, that that's also invaluable to many of these countries, especially handling the traveling back and forth. And so um, these are small steps that we can uh, take to regain our, our um, you know, the, 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 the refrain that you some, sometimes hear from many parts of the Pacific, which is all you really have to do is show up a little bit more and, 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 and help us out uh, with, with the things that we need help with, but you got to show up first. And so I think that's fair criticism for, for us. And, and it's, it's something that we should fix and can fix. I totally agree with uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Case. You know, the United States needs to show consistent presence, you know, in the region, in these areas. You know, one of the things that we do not to, you know, keep um, talking on the military side of the house, but through the, our um, National Guard, we have many states uh, throughout the country, including Hawaii, that have vital, critical state partnerships with many of these countries. Wisconsin has a state partnership with Papua New Guinea and the Adjutant General of Wisconsin uh, works together with his mirror image in Papua New Guinea. And they just don't do military exercises. They do humanitarian and disaster relief exercises. They provide economic uh, support, education, uh, and um, those, those relationship building opportunities. Hawaii is Indonesia and the Philippines, but you know, throughout the entire Pacific, you have valuable relationships and state partnership programs with, with defense attaches in these smaller island nations. And, uh, you know, that's that's something that I think we do. Uh, we do the best we can. We could use more, more funding for it, um, but uh, it, it is what it is. But, you know, I do agree that we need to show a consistent presence and um, there's a lot more that we can do. Well, I, I, I want to thank the four of you for, for joining us, uh, Mr. Kahele, Mr. Case, Mr. Schatz, and uh, Mrs. Hirono. I thank you so much for your time. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. And it was great to see some graduates of Georgetown University and the University of Hawaii at Manoa. <laughs> it's great. Thank you all so much. All the best. Aloha, Bye -bye. everyone. Mahalo, Nilo. Mahalo. Mahalo.